Hey there, you are listening to another episode of Wisdom for Life. This is Pastor Glenn, and today we are covering the subject once again of following the leading of the Holy Spirit. This episode is entitled, Follow the Leader. Our text today is Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to read verse 1 and read verse 4 as well. It says in verse 1, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I just want to remind you that uh, we can assume that the devil knew that Jesus could not be tempted. But the reality is, is the devil didn't know that. The devil is not omniscient. He does not know everything like God does. And so the devil attempts to uh, tempt Jesus and to get him to sin. And the reality was that it was impossible to do that. The two theological terms that we understand, we that we have words for, uh, Jesus not being able to be tempted is immutability and impeccability. Impeccability means that Jesus is without sin, and immutability means that Jesus cannot sin. Jesus knew that he could not sin, but the devil didn't. Likewise, Jesus has the power to defeat the devil through you as well. You know, the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so why does the devil keep trying because he doesn't know this about you as well. And he wants you to be ignorant of it. He doesn't want you to know that Jesus will defeat him in your life, just as he did in the desert. Jesus defeated the devil in private so he could heal and minister in public. I believe the statement that says private victories precede public victories. You know, your character development is important to God. And it must be developed first. Why? Because your gifting will take you places that your character may not keep you. God sees the end of your story. The Bible says he's the author and the finisher of our faith. So he doesn't just see the beginning of your story or where you're at in your story now. God sees the end of your story. And so God is preparing you for the end of your story. And the end of your story is success and it's victory. And it's praise unto him. And so God's going to develop your character now so that later he can do things through you and you'll remain in those places because you'll have the character to remain. And so what is key to all this? Key to all this is what Jesus really taught us as he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. The key to it is hearing God's voice and understanding and focusing, paying attention to God's voice over everything else, tuning out all other distractions and understanding what it is that God is calling us to do in obedience. You see, learning to pay attention and focus on God's voice is learned in the deserts of life. It's learned in the dry places of life, in places where we're attacked by the enemy. We want to hear God really only on the mountaintops, right? But it's in the desert valleys that we learn to distinguish God's voice from our own and God's voice from the world and the enemy's voice. And that leads us to Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, where it says, But he answered and said, after the devil had tempted him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What comes as a surprise is that the first mention of Jesus being led by the Spirit is into the wilderness, and it's into fasting, and it's into temptation. In other words, it's into battle. The Spirit didn't lead him first to preach in his gifting, or heal with his giftings, or deliver people, because he certainly had the gift gifting to do all those things. But the Spirit led him to the wilderness and into fasting. Why is this? Because God wanted to show us the model through Jesus that character development is key. When we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, we'll begin to hear his promptings as well. But they're not usually the leading we would expect or desire to hear. The Holy Spirit will begin to lead us to pray, to fast, to humble ourselves, ask forgiveness, extend forgiveness, give sacrificially, and serve without complaining. 
And all of these things are going to be contrary to our flesh. You see, most people, in fact, would ignore that voice, rebuke the devil because they think that all of those kind of feelings would come from the enemy. Well, feelings do sometimes come from the enemy. Other times, feelings come from you. But when God speaks, God is looking to deal with things in our life that cause us to learn to focus on his voice and not the addiction we have from our flesh for comfort. That voice that comes from us that longs to be entertained and comforted and longs to be in a comfort zone, if you will. So most people would think that it's not God speaking when it when it really is God speaking and calling them from, from living a carnal life in constant pursuit of trying to be satisfied in the comfort zone. So that's a voice that comes from our flesh. Certainly the enemy seeks to uh, reinforce that voice and back up that voice to tempt us. And yet God calls us with his word to live by his word, that we're not to live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You know, God today is still speaking to you. He's speaking, he has words, and his word is always life. So let's let's talk about how to discern the difference between the voice of the Holy Spirit and your own thoughts and emotions in a dry place and in a desert. If you're like me, there have been times in your life when you begin to wonder if the thing you're hearing on the inside, if that inner dialogue is just your emotion, if it's just my thoughts and my emotions, or is this the instruction of the Holy Spirit? You know, sometimes we even get stuck in a religious OCD, and I'm not making fun of that uh, that issue, but, you know, sometimes we get obsessed and we wonder compulsively, where are these thoughts coming from? Are they coming from me or are they coming from God? Is this me or is this God? So I want to show you how to discern between the voice of the Holy Spirit and the voice of our flesh and carnal nature. And I want to introduce you to your carnal nature just for a moment. You know, when you got saved, your spirit was born again, but your flesh wasn't. Your carnal nature is to die, and it's slowly fading and dying away. And so your flesh is never satisfied as it dies. It wants to pull you away and possibly drain you, lead you into more fulfillment, trying to find some way to to get back in that comfort zone and get back in that carnal nature. But but God wants you to have more and more life and more and more victory. Remember that the flesh seeks entertainment and comfort. The flesh and the carnal nature seeks distraction. It wants to have a busy mind so that you don't have to face the truth and you don't have to face and listen to the Holy Spirit. And so the number one thing to remember is just because your flesh has a nature doesn't mean that you don't have another nature. And that nature is a spiritual nature. Your spirit man is connecting with God. And that's exactly what God wants to speak to. He wants to speak to your spirit. He wants you to listen to his spirit. And that comes to you not as a skill, but as a sense from being born again. And so just as you were born physically in a carnal nature, and that carnal nature has an inner dialogue within you, when you came to know Christ, you were also born again. And now the Holy Spirit has a voice within you. And this voice from the Holy Spirit is not a skill. Hearing it is not a skill. It's actually a sense. You had senses when you were born. You have senses when you're born again. And John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus said, Very truly, I tell you, that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You see, here Jesus is talking about those two natures. Once again, he's talking about the carnal nature that's born of the flesh and water and the spiritual nature or the born again nature that is born of the Spirit. So hearing is a sense that is 
a part of being born again in the Spirit. Hearing the Spirit, then, is part of your born-again nature. So why do we struggle to hear the Spirit so often? Well, it is a sense. It's not a skill. But just because we don't need to acquire it as a skill doesn't mean that we don't need to learn how to pay attention to that sense, focus on that sense, and focus on listening, not just hearing. How many of you have learned that over the years, someone can be hearing you, but not truly listening to you? There's a difference between hearing and listening. And we learn to grow, to pay attention and listen to God, not just hear God's spirit in the dry places and valleys of life. You know, C.S. Lewis said this, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Enter the power then of fasting. And this is why Jesus connected the scripture about hearing God's voice and it being life while he fast, fasted in the desert. Hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit is a sense that we're born with, but that skill comes in quieting the flesh. And it's acquired by sharpening the voice of the Lord by denying the flesh. When you're born again, you're born with a sense in the spirit to hear God's voice. In fact, Jesus even said, my sheep hear my voice. But that has to be developed over time. And how is it developed? It's developed in dry places, in deserts, in hard times, sometimes even in pain. This is different than the way you're born in the carnal nature and how you hear in the carnal nature. When you were born physically, you were born hearing and seeing and speaking. You were born with those senses and that ability. You did not have to be taught to see, but your seeing did have to be taught to grow and mature. You didn't have to be taught to hear, but your hearing did have to be taught to mature into attention and focus and understanding. You did not have to be taught to make sounds, but your speaking did have to mature into language so that your words carried meaning and power. So in, even in all these physical senses, you did have to be taught to pay attention, to listen closely, to observe. You had to be taught to make use of those senses. But you didn't need to be taught how to have those senses. You were just born with them. In the same way, you were born again of the Spirit. And it's a new life that you now have that you're born again with. And you have abilities in that new life. You can hear the Holy Spirit. You were born again with the ability to have vision as well by faith in the Spirit. You are born again with the ability to speak by faith in the Spirit. And everyone born again can preach and teach and share and witness by the power of the Holy Spirit. You were born again with spiritual vision, spiritual hearing, and spiritual speaking. You don't have to be taught to have those abilities, but you do have to be taught to pay attention, be still, follow the Spirit's leading, timing, and the Spirit's prompting and direction. And that means quieting the flesh. That means sometimes going through valleys, going through dry places, going through deserts, sometimes even bringing on a fast so that you can learn to quiet the voice of the carnal nature and you can hear the voice of the Spirit again. When you were born again of the Spirit, all of the spiritual senses came with it. So I'm not here to teach you how to gain spiritual hearing. If you're born again, you already have that. Again, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. If you belong to him, you can hear him. Amen? Amen. Maybe you need to confess that today and just share it uh, with yourself today as a proclamation because it's a promise that came from Jesus himself. How you grow in not just hearing, but listening to that voice is through the spiritual disciplines like fasting and prayer, spending time in God's word, 
being still. You know, the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. It's when we're still, when we quiet our flesh and we quiet the world around us, when we refuse to give uh, focus to the devil and our gaze on what the devil wants to distract us with, and we just are still before the Lord, then we begin to hear the Spirit speak and we're able to hear God's voice. Hearing God's voice is not as much informational as it is relational. As you begin to know God and spend time with God, you begin to understand and be able to identify his voice when you hear it. Let me give you an example of this. You know, people call me on the phone all the time. And when I'm talking to them on the phone, they generally, because they're polite, they want to introduce themselves. But since I know them, I know their voice. Introductions are a formality. But really, because I know the person and I've spent some time with the person, I know the person's voice as soon as I hear the first word. I know it because I know not only what the voice sounds like, I know the person. (laughs) Here's another example. If I knew someone, but you didn't, I could pick their voice out of a crowd, but you couldn't because you didn't know the person. Unless you've heard that person's voice for yourself and you knew that person, you can't necessarily pick it out, identify it, and know it. You see, knowing the person is knowing the voice. Uh, here's another way to put it. Uh, working on farms growing up as a kid, I could I learned a lot from farmers, and I learned a lot from animals. And I worked on farms where farmers had sheep and even cows. And when the farmer would show up at the work site, whatever I was doing, whether I was shoveling or building fences, or when the farmer showed up, all of those sheep and all of those cows knew that farmer's voice. They would even respond to that farmer's voice because they had spent time with that farmer. They didn't know my voice. They didn't respond to my voice. They responded to the farmer's voice because they knew him. You see, when you're born again, you have a sense to know God's voice. But you have to develop that sense over time. And how you do that is by spending time with the Father. You identify his voice from all of the noise of the world around you, including the noise that's in your head, your thoughts, thoughts that come from the world, thoughts that come from all the chaos and the confusion that's around us from the enemy. We're able to distinguish God's voice apart from all that. You can't explain knowing how to hear God's voice to someone who is not born again because they do not have that sense of listening and hearing God, just as you cannot explain sight adequately to someone born blind. You cannot explain sound to someone born deaf, and you cannot explain speech adequately to someone born mute. The irony is that born-again people judge the lost for their lack of ability in these areas all the time, when most born-again Christians really have no idea that it is in their born-again nature to hear God themselves, have spiritual vision by faith also for what God is doing, and many times these same Christians shrink back from speaking as an oracle of God in preaching, witnessing, and in prophetic encouragement. You know, growing up as a kid, my dad had an album that he played often, and it was by a band called The Who. They had a song called The Pinball Wizard. On this album, the entire album really told the story of a guy by the name of Tommy, whom the lyrics explain as deaf, dumb, and blind, but he sure plays a mean pinball. I wonder if you remember the song or not. And and, and so he is in a state of not being able to see, not being able to hear, or to speak but he's able to play pinball by some miraculous skill that he has. He's a young man who has gained adoring fans who just come to see him play pinball, even though he's unable to do all of these other things that everyone else can do. He becomes this religious leader, and he has disciples that even follow him because of the miracle he produces while playing pinball. I know it's it's ludicrous, but just just stay with me here. 
This is the way that the carnal flesh speaks and leads, and not the spirit. To gain attention, notoriety, fanfare, and fame. To develop some type of skill that would entertain and muse yourself and others. But the reality is, at the same time, by listening and following the flesh, we may be able to play pinball and amaze people with that for a moment, but we're unable to truly see God and see what God sees. We're unable to hear God. What We're unable to hear his voice. We're unable to speak his word to people. And that is the state the devil would love you and I to remain in. Just like Tommy, be able to play a little pinball and amuse people with some of our talents, but never develop as believers and being born again and hearing God, seeing what God sees by faith and speaking on behalf of the Lord. Some other ways that we can look at this is to understand that God's voice is not just a sense God's voice is stable. God's voice is stable. God's voice is stable and consistent. Your voice and the voice from the world and the voice from the enemy is inconsistent. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8 helps us to understand that God's word never changes. It is always the same. The verse says, the grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of our God endures forever. I hope you can take some type of peace and solace in that. You know, our moods and our feelings will contradict themselves. One day it's this, another it's that. The world will say something one day. The next day they'll totally say something different. And these are not, this is not the voice of God or the voice that comes from the Spirit of God. God's voice is always stable and consistent. Here's the next one. God's voice guides or draws you, but the world's voice, the enemy's voice, even your voice sometimes pushes and shoves you like a bully. Psalms chapter 23, verse two, speaking of God as the good shepherd says that he leads me besides the still waters. There's a few things that we can glean from that verse. And the first is that God is the good shepherd, and that means he goes in front of us. He goes first and then draws us to where he is. He's not behind us because we are not cattle. He's not driving us. He's drawing us as a shepherd. The devil and the flesh, they are like cattle drivers. They will push you. The spirit is a shepherd. He will guide you and draw you. The devil is fear-based. Your flesh and your carnal nature is impulsive and fear-based, and it's wrapped up in intense emotion. But God's voice is stable and calm. You know, in Scripture, we see that Jesus did all kinds of things. He walked, he ate, he wept, he slept, but Jesus never ran. God's spirit is never in a rush. God is not impulsive. God knows what he's doing. He is calm and he's drawing us to himself and those are good places in him. And here lastly, God's voice will always align with the scriptures. You know, we've talked about how God's voice will draw us and God's voice is stable, that God's voice is a sense. God's voice is also something that always aligns with his word or scripture. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, it says that God is not a man that he should lie. He's not a human that he would change his mind. You know what that means, folks? That means that God will never speak something that's against his word. Not ever. Don't trust yourself or your flesh. Don't trust the voices that come from the world or the voice that comes from the enemy. Stop living your life from the place of experience and what you think you are hearing from God and start living your life from the place of God's word and his scripture. You know, the word should interpret your reality, not your reality interpreting the word. And so we see all these points in our episode today, beautifully illustrated in the life of Jesus. As he was baptized in the spirit, he was led by the spirit, drawn by the spirit to that dry place, to that desert place where he faced the enemy. 
and in facing the enemy, he began to fast. And in his fasting, that part of his nature, that was flesh, you know, Jesus in the hypostatic union, they call it, was 100% God, but also 100% man. That man part of his nature was quieted. And so that his spirit could hear the spirit of God. And he begins to tell the enemy what the word of God says, not what his feelings say, not what his circumstances say. Of course, his feelings was telling him to eat, that he was hungry. His feelings were telling him in his circumstances were telling him to turn that stone into bread. Instead, he spoke the word to the enemy and hearing God's voice, following God's voice, using God's word, he was able in that moment, even through fasting, to demonstrate to us how we can hear God's voice. Even in a place that is unlikely as a dry and desert place where the enemy is shouting. Jesus is showing us and empowering us today that we can hear God's voice too. We only need to quiet that part of ourself that seeks to be comforted and entertained and that part of ourself that clouds out the sense that we have of hearing God's voice. What can you do about it? Fasting, praying, Spending time alone with God, even in the midst of your worst situation, spending time with God and fasting, following the leading of the Spirit, even if it's in a dry place. Discerning between God's voice and your voice is a major role of fasting. The flesh is loud and needs to be muzzled. And if you won't obey the voice of the flesh, Satan will find some outside ways to get your attention. When your flesh is silenced, Satan will shout even louder. The flesh is silenced with fasting, but Satan and the enemy is silenced with the word of God. God bless you and thank you for listening, folks. You're in my prayers. Have a wonderful day in being led by the Holy Spirit.